In part one, we talked about looking at cards as investments and how that was actually flawed when what we were really doing was speculating. In part two, we're going to look at what some of the so-called experts in the card market were telling us, and actually, if you did the exact opposite of what they were saying, you would have come out better long term. So first example here, we're going to look at Sports Card Investor, and a post he made back in July of 2021, where he's showing us these two Michael Jordan cards, and they're actually PSA 10 copies of the 86 Fleer Rookie. And if you look at the card there on the right, I want you to look at that cert number because we're going to see exactly what he paid for the card on Golden Auction. And this had ended back in April of that same year, where he had paid a little over half a million dollars for that card. And we can go over to PSA's website here and see that that is in fact the price that he paid. They're showing a little bit higher. I think that might be due to fees or something like that. But here's the card itself, and we can see the certain number matches here. So he paid a little over half a million dollars for an 86 Flair Jordan which if you look at the other prices that they list on the PSA website, that card actually significantly dropped in value over the next couple months, up until late last year, which is the last sale of the card that they show here at $191,000. Now we know from other auctions that have been in recently that this card is well under the $200,000 mark. The next example I have went over on Blowout Card Forms, where Jeff had posted his LeBron James Topps Chrome Refractor Collection, and what form member 90s kid figured out was that he actually paid the top price to this day for the 0304 Topps Chrome Refractor Rookie Card. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see that he paid $273,000 on 37 of 2021. And we can see there that that sale was the top price ever paid for that card, and then it started to drop quite significantly over those next few months. And you may be like me, where these high-end auctions don't really pertain to you. You're buying more in like the mid-end range or the low-end range, and I totally understand that. I wanted to point out these two because what happened was around that time, it also affected the low-end as well. And you may have seen me throw out this photo of Gary Vee in the past. I like to use this for my what happened in the junk slab error section of my mail and hobby talk videos. But I want to zoom in a little bit on the right side of this photo and show you a big stack of cards here. And those are all 2018 Prism rookie cards of Luka Doncic. So this stuff was happening also in that kind of mid to lower end range as well. Around the time he was talking about these cards, these cards had shot up to a little under $1,500. And then they continued to drop off a cliff. And this was back in 2020. This was back during almost the height of the boom. I guess nowadays you can go over to his VFriends website and apparently you can purchase this card from his personal collection. Estimated value of $191. I guess he's wanting you to pay in cryptocurrency, but you can pick up the same card from him, maybe from that same stack of cards that he had for $191. So we have to ask ourselves, what's happening here? Why were these cards that these guys were talking about immediately dropping in value after they discussed them? Well, there's a concept we have to talk about, and it's the pump and dump scheme. I'm not saying that these guys were going into this trying to pull off something illegal. I want to get that up front. But basically what a pump and dump scheme is an investor, a group of investors, promoting something that they're holding. And then once the price surges, they immediately sell. Now I do believe that Gary Vee sold a lot of the cards that he was buying. I actually don't think Jeff did. No, I don't have anything to back that up. I think Jeff was actually more or less showing the cards that he bought as more of a flex for like social media or something like that. If we look at a continued definition here, we see that one of the favored medium of communication in these schemes is social media platforms. We also see that this artificially increases interest in these cards. And what they're talking about here is like stocks, but we can say the same thing about cards. So for a time, they may continue to go up, but that time period is really short. So once the pump happens, then afterwards the dump happens where everybody needs to sell off quickly in order to make money. And I do want to reiterate that I don't think these guys were purposely out there trying to scam people, but look at what happened here. When they talked about these cards, they immediately rose in value, but then we saw a steep decline over the next couple months. And this does line up perfectly with what we talked about in part one, where we're actually speculating on cards where they have a very short time span where they're worth a lot of money and then they drop dramatically in value. So again, it doesn't really add up to that whole investor mentality of holding things long term. So where do we go from here? Hopefully I've made it fairly clear that we need to stop listening to these influencers who are telling us what to buy and instead do our own thing in the hobby. At best, they were naive and didn't really understand what they were doing. At worst, they were using their influence to artificially inflate card prices for specific players or even sets. 
Back during the card boom, it was also a sentiment among many collectors to do the exact opposite of what the majority of people were being told to do. And this actually worked out quite well for myself and others, where we were able to pick up some amazing cards by selling the cards that these guys were telling us to buy and doing exactly the opposite and buying the cards that nobody was talking about at the time. And even during the boom, there were buying opportunities. And I want to give you an example of a player that I collect, Noel Gallinari, whose prices were never really pushed into the stratosphere. And, you know, I totally understand if you don't collect a guy like this. But these card prices, even back in 2021, are very similar to the prices that I'm seeing today even in late 2022 and now in early 2023. And talking about a great opportunity that I've seen recently is buying graded cards of players that haven't been overly hyped during the pandemic, aren't continuing to be hyped, but maybe they're players that you collect or want to start collecting. I've seen a lot of graded cards that people are trying to unload because they just graded so many during the boom that you're going to see a lot of great deals continue now into the future, maybe in the next couple years we're going to be able to pick up this stuff for dirt cheap. So maybe you're not like me and you don't want to collect a guy who's pretty much on his way out of the league like Alinari, or you're not really interested in the low-end graded cards. What if you're more interested in one of the current players who's getting a lot of hype, hyped rookie, something of that nature? Let's take a look at John Morant. And I just did a search on Google for John Morant in comparisons to current players, and I ran across this article from Fansighted where they're comparing John Morant to past and current NBA stars. And the first one they come across here is they're comparing him to Russell Westbrook. We'll take a look at that first. So we're gonna jump over here to 130point.com, which is a website that I like a lot to look at like past sales. And what I typed in here is I typed in the 2019 Ja Morant Gold Prism. So we're not talking specifically about Prism, but just any gold prism from that year. And you can scroll through this and some of these results might not be perfect, right? But here's a Panini Prism rookie selling for 6,500 bucks, thereabouts. A Prism Mosaic for around 400 bucks. We've got this Contenders Optic Gold, which was selling for almost close to $9,000. We've even got this Optic Choice Black Gold. I've really heard of those, but selling for 7,500 bucks. So now if I search for Russell Westbrook from 2008, I can take a look at some of his card prices. And there's probably his best gold refractor rookie card there, the Topps Chrome, selling for a little over 1500 bucks. We see a Bowman Chrome selling for around 800 Another one, a, uh, it's a blue. But anyway, you, you kind of get the idea of what we're going after here. So we're making comparisons. We're basically saying if John Morant had a career on the level of these guys that they're saying that they might be similar to, what would their card prices look like? Let's jump back here and look at the next comparison that they're making here, and that's to Allen Iverson. So okay, we're gonna look at sales for Allen Iverson now. I couldn't find anything that would like match up exactly. There was gold refractors in 96, but when comparing decades, it's a little bit harder. We'll take a look at the Topps Finest Refractor, which is a real popular one. Here's one in uh, SGC8 for 190. We see Stadium Club Atomic Refractor. I think that's a dual. 96-97 Topps Chrome Refractor, which is probably his most comparable card. In Topps Chrome that year, they just had two variations of it. It was the Baser Refractor. That's probably his most well-known Topps Chrome Refractor card. Again, selling for 1500 bucks, similar to the Westbrook Chrome Gold, selling for around that same basic price. Essentially what I'm trying to show you here is that if you're in this for the long term and you're actually looking to collect cards, you might want to consider doing something like this. Instead of just going out and hearing what the next hype prospect is, either from an influencer or maybe just some person that you see on Instagram posting their cards, you might want to actually just take a step back a look at what these cards could turn into in the future and then ask yourself is that actually worth the money that you're spending now on those cards and if you stuck around to the end i want to say thank you i had a lot of fun making this series i may do something else like this again in the future but we are going to get back to normal card content i will be recording a mail and hobby talk episode here soon and i'm also planning to do some more binder videos but thanks again for watching and i will catch you on the next one